This is The Road Show, and I'm your host, David Warren. On today's program, we welcome back Rick Renner, visiting from Moscow, Russia, and here to talk about the latest book in his series, A Light in Darkness. While preparing for today's program, I began to realize that today's road show will be one of the most important ones that I've hosted over these last 30 years. Let's get started. Welcome back, Rick Renner. It's good to be here. David, why do you believe it will be one of the most important? Because I read the book. I know the subject after having read the book, and it is a word for today. Even though it's based on the church in a place called Pergamum from the first century, it's so relevant to the 21st century, and I'm going to ask you to compare the two here in just a bit. Well, if you read this book, I have to say congratulations because it weighs six pounds. Well, now, I didn't read everything in this book. This is a very large book. It does weigh (laughs) six pounds. And how much research would you say went into this? Oh, I've been to Turkey multiple times and have been to all these sites. And a lot of it really is firsthand exploration. And I went with experts from Turkey. And so... Years of research. The name of the book is No Room for Compromise, subtitled Christ's Message to Today's Church. And it is volume two in your A Light in Darkness series. So let's roll back a little bit here and talk about the premise for this book series. Okay. I began many years ago teaching a series called Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. And it was my favorite of everything that I taught. And I made a decision that I was going to write a series on the seven messages to the seven churches. And I was going to write a book series for me. What seven churches are you referring to? The seven churches in the book of Revelation. Okay. That would be Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. There's seven of them. And I wanted to write a series on Christ's message to those seven churches. And those messages are found in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. But I decided that this would be a book series that I would write for me. Now, this book is absolutely illustrated from the beginning to the end. Don't you think it's beautiful? It is. I mean, this is a coffee table book. It's a coffee table book. That you want to read as well. Well, the reason I did it this way is because I wanted it to be a book that would sit on somebody's coffee table. And there's so much information that I was afraid that people wouldn't just read this book from cover to cover. So I wanted to entertain them with photographs and with art. And David, I'm so pleased. I I just think that it's beautiful. And so I wrote this book, and this particular book took me about two years to write. So the first series also took about two years, and there's two more books in the series. So this is volume two. Volume 3 and Volume 4 are still in front of us. Let's talk about the chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Revelation. Okay. What was going on? John had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And actually he had been put on trial in the city of Rome before the Emperor Domitian. And history is pretty clear. I mean, it's repeated many times in history that at John's trial, uh, they attempted to execute him. And they dipped him into a vat of boiling oil. And uh, boiling people in oil was a pretty regular way of executing prisoners back in those days, especially if you were considered to be a political prisoner. But when they pulled John out of the oil, he was completely unburned. And it terrified Domitian because this was the man they couldn't cook. And so they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. And while he was on the Isle of Patmos, living in a cave... You can go there. I've been there. In that cave, he had a revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's why the book of Revelation is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 1, Christ literally stepped into that cave and revealed himself to John. And it was the first time that John had seen Jesus for more than 60 years. Isn't that something? Hmm. It had been 60 years since he had felt the touch of Jesus or the voice of Jesus, but the touch of Jesus was the same, the voice of Jesus was the same, just Jesus' appearance was glorious. That had changed. So these were obviously seven very important messages that Jesus wanted recorded in the Bible. 
very important. And in fact, in Asia, really was the it was the hotbed for all mission activity. Uh, Ephesus was the big church. It was about a hundred thousand members, and the church of Ephesus had planted while Paul was there all of these other churches, and they were located on a postal road. You know, sometimes we get real complicated in th- how we think the Holy Spirit's got to lead us, but in fact, they just followed the road. So if you leave Ephesus and follow the road, it goes to Smyrna. And if you keep following the road, it goes to Pergamum. You keep following the road, it goes next to Thyatira. Then it goes to Sardis. Then it goes to Philadelphia. Then it goes to Laodicea. And if you keep following the road, it's a circular road. You end up back at Ephesus. So the missionaries just followed the road. And inside that road were cities like Colossae, Hierapolis, other New Testament cities. They just basically followed the road and then begin to evangelize on the interior of that road. I think it's very interesting. Well, obviously, uh, Christ's message to the church in Pergamum, one of the seven churches referred to in Revelation, uh, that caught your eye as you read the Bible. In fact, you dedicate this whole volume to, to that message, and we're going to get into that here in just a bit. But let's talk about the city that is discussed in the book called Pergamum. Where was Pergamum? Because it does not exist anymore. Well, it does exist. In fact, that's what really got my attention. I took a trip to Turkey and visited the seven sites of the seven churches. And so it's a, it does exist. There's a, there's a newer village which is built just on the outskirts, but the ruins of Pergamum are still there. Okay. And when I saw the ruins of Pergamum and they sat on top of a mountain, the demonic presence, which can still be felt in that place today, is so real that it just captivated me. And I decided that I was going to dig as deep as I could dig to find out what in the world took place in that city. Let's talk geography a little bit. Where is Pergamum? Pergamum is in Turkey. It is 60 miles from the Aegean Sea. It sits right on top of a mountain. And what was it famous for? It was famous because it was the proconsul's headquarters for Asia. So whatever happened in Pergamum happened in the whole of Asia. And what was bad for believers was that whenever the edict came forth to begin killing believers, that edict came forth from the city of Pergamum. Pergamum was also the center of uh, the worship of the emperor. And so if you lived in Pergamum, you were forced to worship the emperor. It was also a citadel filled with all kinds of religions. If I said to you that there were hundreds of temples, it would be an understatement. That's not an exaggeration. There were temples to all kinds of gods. And David, if you went with me there, I could give you a tour. I know Pergamum. Well, we're going to talk about a a virtual tour. Okay. That you can take our listeners on here in just a bit. But uh, what was it like to be a Christian in first century Pergamum? Well, it was deadly because you were required to worship the emperor. In fact, Pergamum was called the seat of Satan. And there was a great throne there to Zeus, which many believers thought maybe was the seat of Satan and possibly it was. But as a city, you were forced to worship the emperor. And if you did not worship the emperor, it required your life. And in fact, in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus refers to one specific individual whose name was Antipas. And this was a man who gave his life. And the way that he gave his life in Pergamum was just horrible. You want to hear about it? Well, it is lunchtime, so uh, just remember that as you're telling our listeners. Well, they arrested him because... The pagan priests in all of the temples said he was disturbing the spiritual atmosphere with his preaching. So he was summoned by the proconsul, who was the governor of Pergamum, and was told, burn incense to the gods and reject this faith in Jesus Christ. He said, no, I will not do that. So they took him, bound him, and put him inside a hollow copper bull. Now, the bull was one of the most sacred symbols in the pagan world. They believed it was a symbol of fertility and that if you would offer the sacrifice of a bull, that you would have special favor with the gods. 
so the bull was a sacred symbol. But it had a door on the side. And so they wrapped him up, put him inside the bull, and set a fire under it. And they literally cooked him inside this bull. And in the head of the bull were musical instruments, so that when the person was cooking to death inside the bull and would begin to scream, his screams would go through those musical instruments, and it would sound like the moaning or the groaning of a bull, and it, so the death almost made the animal seem to come alive. And that's how Antipas was killed. Why did the Roman Empire use such things as entertainment for its people? Well, you know what? There's a lot of similarities in the world today. I just I just went to see a film, which is very popular right now. It is one of the most violent things I have ever seen. And people clap. They get so excited. And you know, David, the Bible prophesies that in the end of the age, man will become brutal, savage. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And there's a lot of similarities between what went on then and what's going on now. In the first century world, they attended real-life events. Today, we watch it on our computers. We watch it in the movie theater. Uh, there's a lot of brutality still in the world today. I'm David Warren speaking with Rick Renner, and he has written Volume 2 of A Light in Darkness, the book series, and the name of the new book is No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. When we come back from this break, we're going to get into the meat of the purpose of this book, and that is to compare Christ's message to today's church with that of the church at Pergamum, which we've heard so much about so far in today's program. We'll both be back after this. I want to read a little bit about today's guest, Rick Renner. He is a respected leader, author, and teacher within the global Christian community. Rick ministered widely throughout the U.S. for many years before answering God's call in 1991 to move his family to the former Soviet Union and plunge into the work of establishing its newly emerging church. Rick works alongside his wife, Denise, to see the gospel preached, leadership trained, and the church established throughout the world. Today, Rick's TV broadcast, Good News with Rick Renner, can be seen in more than 100 nations, and his best-selling books have been translated into multiple languages. Rick and Denise and their three sons and their families live in Moscow, Russia. And today we are talking about Volume 2 of A Light in Darkness book series by Rick Renner, and it's entitled No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church, and... I said that the bulk of our time would be comparing Christ's message in the book of Revelation uh, to the church of Pergamum, now in modern-day Turkey, to uh, the message that Christ has for today's church. And uh, I'm pretty much giving it away, but what was the purpose for writing this book? Compromise. Uh, the church of Pergamum was tempted to make compromise and to become inclusive. And it's interesting, that's the big word today to become inclusive of everyone and what they believed. And as long as you were not exclusive or had an exclusionary view in your faith, you could be very accepted. So this gentleman who was cooked inside the calf you mentioned, yes, if he would have said, well, it's okay for you to believe what you believe, just let me believe what I want to believe, which is Christianity, he would have been okay. He would have been okay. Probably wouldn't have been great, but he would have lived. Okay. And that's kind of the cry of what's going on in the world today. The word bullying is used a lot in today's world. And there's talk about how Christians bully other people. But the truth is the Christian community is being bullied. And we're being told that it's not right for us to have an exclusionary faith. And I have to tell you, David, as I travel around the United States, I'm quite shocked at what I see going on inside the church. I mean, people are surrendering territory. They're surrendering doctrine. They're ignoring major doctrines uh, because they don't want to appear to be exclusionary. They want to be more inclusive. But you really cannot be a committed Christian and be inclusive of what everybody believes. Are you seeing this in the church in Russia as well or no? just the U.S.? I'm seeing it in the West. The church in Russia is still in revival. Uh, I mean, the walls of communism only fell in 1991. And so people are just learning the truth, and they are adapting to the truth. We're having a great revival in Russia. I mean, it's 
I wish you could come and could see it with your own eyes. The services are full. People are coming to Christ. And it's interesting to me, this always fascinates me, people never talk about when they were saved. People always talk about the day they repented. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? If you say, when did you come to know the Lord? They'd say, well, the day that I repented, there's a very strong turn in people's minds from who they were to who they are now. And people are learning the Bible, taking a strong, firm stand. And President Putin, of whom I'm a great fan. Uh, you want that on tape? I want it, sure. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of President Putin. He has taken a very strong moral position for the family. And um, Russia is just morally... Now, I'm not telling you that I agree with all their political decisions, but morally, they're really headed in a direction where the United States once was. Rick, you're a real spiritually sensitive man. So what is it like for you once you arrive in the United States to visit where you were born? Disappointment. I get off the airplane and I'm just almost immediately disappointed in what I see. I see a culture that has become so confused that it's not even certain what is an American. Now, our listeners may not understand that. But America is a very confused country, and I think a lot of people feel that way, and it's it's very sad to me. And it, I and I feel the church is confused. The church is confused about what it believes. It's trying to figure out how it's supposed to fit into the new culture, and it doesn't fit in the new culture. Well, when there are multiple choices to the answer, there's confusion. Well, and there's not always multiple answers. You know, if you try to, if you try to be yes to everything, it's you. You just can't do that. You have to take a moral position on some issues. I like how in the book, no room for compromise. You compare the paganism of first-century Pergamum to what you call the paganism in the 21st century. Now, what would paganism have included? back in the first century obviously worship of idols well but you don't have to have the worship of idols to have paganism that was just their little add-on paganism is really it's inclusivity it's where everybody's right and nobody's wrong i'm going to read from the book you say paganism at its core is religious pluralism that's right thus its very nature staunchly opposes any message that preaches a single absolute truth above all others. That's exactly right. Paganism says anything goes. If you had walked into pagan Rome or pagan Pergamum, you would have seen everybody was fine with everything. And if you had a view that your way was the only way, which is what we believe with Christianity, you would have stood out in the crowd and they would have thought you were just terrible. And you would have been persecuted for that. All Christians had to do was just tone down their message. All they had to do was burn a little incense. And there were a lot of people who would have said, what would it hurt for you just to burn a little incense? It wouldn't affect your salvation. It'll preserve your life. You'll get along with your neighbors. But Christ absolutely refused to allow them to compromise. And they died for it. And I personally believe that we're headed for a period where there could be some persecution in the West because of issues of morality which are being raised. And I believe that we're going to see really who is going to stand by the Word of God and who is going to compromise. How do you envision persecution? Oh, I think persecution can be legal. It can be prosecution. Uh, in the first century, it started with prosecution. And once it begins, it it can it can go anywhere from there. It can it can be with bullying, bullying somebody into surrendering what they believe, bullying somebody into changing their position, telling them they're going to lose their job. Um, there's all kinds of persecution. Interesting that I don't feel any of that in Russia. Isn't isn't that funny? In a country that was communist, today we don't feel that at all. Rick Renner is our guest, and uh, 
Revelation 2 mentions people whom Christ called Nicolaitans. Did I say that right? You did. Who were these people? The word Nicolaitans is a compound of two Greek words, the word nikas from nike, which means to conquer, and the word laos, which means the people. And when you put these two words together, figuratively, it means the people conquerors. And the Nicolaitans were those who were promoting inclusion and compromise. And the Bible likens them to the doctrine of Balaam. And of course, Balaam tried to curse the people of God, and he could not. And there's a lot of talk about Balaam. You know, was Balaam a prophet of God? Was he a witch? He was a witch. And there are a lot of Jewish resources that tell all about Balaam. You can study about Balaam outside of the New Testament. And in fact, Balaam was a contemporary with Moses. And he was such a contemporary with Moses that it was Moses who gave the order to kill Balaam. I don't, I don't know if you've ever put Balaam and Moses in the same time frame, but Moses gave the order for Balaam to be killed. And Balaam was a great sorcerer. And he tried to curse Israel three times. He went up on the top of a mountain. He slaughtered a beast, uh, offered it in sacrifice, and tried to curse Israel. Three different times he tried to do this. And every time he opened his mouth, a blessing came out. And finally he said, I cannot curse what God has blessed. I just cannot do it. And so King Balak, who had hired Balaam, uh, Balaam went to him and said, I have a different way of defeating the people. Since I can't curse them, let's lure them into compromise and sin. And so these men of Israel had not been home for a long time, and they'd been away from their women. So he sent the prostitutes of the Midianites and the Moabites out, and they literally dangled themselves in front of the men. And the Bible tells us that the men of Israel joined themselves unto these women and the women then said, bow before our God. And the men compromised. And that compromise was what Christ refers to when he talks about the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam. The Amplified Bible, in parentheses, calls Nicolaitans corruptors of the people. That's right. Theirs, I'm reading now, theirs was a doctrine of self-protecting compromise and accommodation with a pagan culture that surrounded the Pergamene congregation. That's right. I found it interesting while reading in the book of Revelation, because I was inspired to, and plus it's all throughout your book, No Room for Compromise, that Jesus hated, the word hated or hates was used in the Bible to describe how he viewed what the Nicolaitans were doing. That's correct. And it's important to note that he never said he hated the Nicolaitans. He said he hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I don't believe Jesus hates anybody. But he was very opposed to what they were doing inside the church, which was promoting this doctrine of compromise, like you said, accommodation. Let's just accommodate the world around us. Let's quit preaching as hard as we've preached. Let's change our songs. Let's change the way we dress. Let's accommodate the world that is around us, and then we will lower the bar of persecution. And that's what they did. And unfortunately, that's what's happening today. You know, David, there's a, a lot of churches, you know, if I can just be really honest, large churches that I used to go to where you could feel the presence and the fire of God when you came into those churches. Those churches are not the same today. I was just in a church recently, a very large church, which one time had a move of the spirit. Today, that's not allowed. Um, it's just gone from one position all the way over to the other position to make church comfortable for people that are unbelievers. The church was not created for unbelievers. The church, just by definition of the word church, is for people that are called out. But they've tried to turn the church into an environment where anyone can be comfortable. Therefore, let's remove anything that could be offensive. So let's change the songs. Let's not talk about the blood as much as we used to talk about the blood. In fact, very rarely do you hear songs about the blood. Um, let's not allow any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
it has just been eliminated as churches have tried to accommodate unbelievers. It's 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 a very strange position. I'm going to, with your permission, Rick Renner, and I say your name because on radio you've got people tuning in throughout the program. I'm David Warren, your host, and we're talking about Rick's book, No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. And I would like to read three short passages okay. from your book and pause after each one and let you comment. Okay. All right. Can we do that? Sure. Okay. This first section is called Spiritual Infection, Then and Now. As you will see in the pages of this volume, there were some leaders in the Church of Pergamum who were intentionally manipulating the message of the gospel to make it less demanding and more accommodating to other religions and other points of view. Because the dominant pagan culture couldn't stomach the idea of a strict exclusionary faith that claimed to be above all others, these errant spiritual leaders attempted to coerce Christians into inwardly choosing to make their faith more inclusive of other beliefs. Some believers succumbed to this pressure and began to spread this corruption of truth throughout the Church of Pergamum like a spiritual infection. That's exactly what was going on. And that's what's going on today. That is a very prophetic chapter. For anybody who gets this book, these first three chapters are very prophetic, not just describing the past, but describing the present and also describing the future, where we're headed as a church. And David, there's got to be a repentance in the church, and it's got to start from the top all the way to the bottom. That's the, that's the only way that a real transformation is going to take place. So much territory has already been lost. This book really is sounding the alarm, isn't it? It is. It is. Okay. Get a drink there, and I'm going to read the next one. This one's called The Winds of Change. It is no secret that the spiritual environment in the world is undergoing a radical change. A great gulf is beginning to divide those who reject absolute truth and those who see what is happening and respond by renewing their commitment to the faith. The winds of change are blowing, separating the wheat from the chaff. Even identifying who is wheat and who is chaff can become a point of contention depending on the group to which one belongs. Unfortunately, what we currently see and feel is only the beginning of the rift that is developing within the church world. Unless a major revival occurs, this rift will grow only deeper and wider. If repentance doesn't melt the hearts of people throughout the church world, it will eventually seem like there are three churches. And you list the three. Here's the first type of church. A church that holds fast to the truth and faces the brunt of opposition because it refuses to bend. The second kind of church. A church in the middle trying to ride the fence through accommodation or compromise in order to avoid persecution and societal rejection. And then the third kind of church. A lukewarm, Laodicean-like church that has allowed compromise to run its full course, stripping it completely of the power of God and leaving Jesus standing on the outside. Comment. That's exactly where we are. Those three churches exist right now. And most churches are church number two. They're riding the fence, trying to figure out where they're going to go. A lot of churches have already gone to number three. Uh, D David, I was just in a church where... Christian church. Christian church, where the music was right. Everything was right. There was a form of godliness. But there was absolutely no power there. Because they have stripped everything that is confrontational. You cannot have Christianity without confrontation. What are signs that the power isn't there or the power is waning in a church? Uh, when For me, it's when I feel like I'm in a place that's hollow. There is no sense of the Spirit of God. It's just a big hollow place. It's very uncomfortable and it is a very difficult place to preach. And when you're told before you preach what you can say and what you cannot say, uh, I just want to pick my Bible up and say, see you later. Okay, now let's back the truck up here. That has happened to you. Yeah, that's happened to me. Even in charismatic churches? Even in charismatic churches. And how does a pastor 
have the guts, or how does he word it, to someone of your stature of, of delivering the word of God? He says, I'm the pastor of this church, and there are some things which we don't do anymore. Like? Uh, we don't speak in tongues. Why? So, because we don't want to offend people. We uh, we don't deal with issues of sexuality publicly because we don't want to take a position. We don't want to lose anyone. You know, there's a big fear about losing people. Uh, we don't want to lose income. We don't want to lose people. So don't please don't touch any of those issues. Uh, we don't want to be sued. A lot of pastors are afraid of being sued. And to be honest, a lot of pastors are just afraid. With all the new laws that are emerging... And with the decisions which are about to be made in federal courts probably this year, pastors are afraid. And so they're backing up rather than moving forward. We have a lot of pastors listening to us right now. What is your word to them? My word to them is to stick with the truth. And if we experience a little fire, well, welcome to the fire. It's nothing new. There is a reason New Testament believers were persecuted, and it's because they were different. They did not do what they were told. They stood out in society, and people said that they were intolerant. It's exactly what they're saying about us today. But they simply had a truth that they adhered to, and they stuck to. And I would say to pastors, stand by the truth. Don't be offensive. We don't have to be offensive. You can speak the truth without being offensive. And pastors just need to... Have Remember, they've been called by Jesus, and they're going to answer to Jesus for what they do. How will you handle this in the future where, when you're asked to speak and uh, something like that is told you before you go up to minister? Well, I've already been told this. What did you do? I find a way to say what I believe <laughs> In another way. You Wise know, as a serpent, gentle as a dove. You know, when you're in submission to a pastor, you, you have to honor what he has requested. It's his church. It's his congregation. I'm a pastor. If, so, if somebody came to my church and I asked them not to do something, I would expect them to respect my request. But it probably I wouldn't go back to that church. If the rules were laid out pretty clear that we're not taking moral positions and we are doing everything we can to avoid confrontation with culture, then I probably wouldn't go back to that church. I'm not for that church. I'm going to read one more passage from the book. Are you having a good time I on am. today's program? I am. I'm enjoying you. You kind of look like you were. People can't see it, but I can. They can hear it in your voice. This is called The Call to Be God's Remnant. You write, God has always had his remnant who will not bow to external pressures. And in these last times, he will have that remnant once again. And those who refuse to fear or to compromise their faith in Jesus Christ will experience previously unknown levels of the power of God as a result of their commitment to stand by truth. Are you seeing these previously unknown levels of the power of God as a result of your stance? I am. I am in my personal life. And I know that those who are uh, taking a position that they're going to stand firm, I don't know that they're seeing demonstrations of power in terms of signs and wonders, but they are definitely seeing firmer commitment, greater passion, greater conviction in their own lives. David, I, I've never felt more conviction in my life than right now. And I believe that there is a remnant that is coming forth. And that we've talked a lot about the Aaron church, but there is a remnant. And maybe we have some pastors listening to us today, who, and they are also part of that remnant. And they've already made the decision, we're going to stand by truth. And I just want to say, friend, that the day is coming when you're going to have to make that decision. You will have to make that decision. A quote from No Room for Compromises. The following, in order for the church to receive the divine power it needs for correction, change, and restoration, it must undergo a transformation from the highest to its lowest levels. That's correct. We've been talking to pastors, but I'm not a pastor, but I'm part of the church. Describe this transformation. Well, transformation. Hmm. 
a transformation back to the basics, a transformation back to the power of God. Uh, for, uh, for example, if a church has eliminated the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I'll give you a concrete example. Okay. We went to a church where, before the service, the pastor said to me, now I was there with Denise, and the pastor said to me, we no longer speak in tongues in our church. We believe in that, but we just don't do that thing anymore because we don't want to offend visitors. Well, I never had an opportunity to talk to Denise before the service began. <laughs> so Denise stood up to sing, and she immediately began to sing in tongues. And you could feel it was like ice went through the whole congregation. They were I mean, they were just stunned, and they didn't even know what she was doing. And the pastor stood up and said, well, what you just heard is called speaking in tongues, and we don't do this in our church. My wife was so humiliated, and I, and to be honest, David, I was laughing because Denise was in such a horrible position. And I thought, this, this is just the funniest position for her to be in. But he began to apologize for the Holy Spirit. He had taken his church so far the other direction, they didn't even know what speaking in tongues was. And this was a church I helped establish. It was a church that was on fire with the gifts of the Holy Spirit at one time. For them to go back, they're probably going to lose members of their church because they received people not telling them the full truth. So if they're going to make a turnaround and go back to the gifts of the Spirit, go back to what we would view as a spirit-filled church, it's going to take a total transformation. It's going to take repentance, a willingness to lose some people, to do things different. And I don't Get rid of the embarrassment. Get rid of the embarrassment. And I don't think that that pastor will be willing to do that. But we will. We will. Rick Renner is our guest on today's program, and we're talking about his... New book, No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. It's volume two in the A Light in Darkness series, and uh, both books and other goodies are available on the website. We'll talk about some of the other items as well coming up in our final segment. Uh, the web address is renner.org, R-E-N-N-E-R dot O-R-G. There's also a toll-free number to call that you can order the book, one 800 742 5593 800-742-5593. I'll repeat that information here in just a bit. But when we come back from the break, in our remaining time, I'd like to discuss the biblical and historical research that went into a book of this magnitude, and that includes those trips to Turkey that you mentioned earlier. Loved we'll talk Turkey right after this. Okay, the name of the book again we're talking about is No Room for Compromise, Christ's message to today's church. Now, this and volume one in the A Light and Darkness series are available through renner.org, R-E-N-N-E-R dot O-R-G, and by calling 1-800-742-5593. And uh, this book is almost six pounds. That's right. Over 400 color images. It's a hardcover coffee table style. Isn't it beautiful? Well, you're very proud of this book. Well, you know, we put a lot of work into this because I just believe if we're going to do something for Jesus, it ought to be first class. Well, it mixes the Bible and the message we've been talking about today with a whole lot of history. And you have made a lot of trips to Turkey where the city of Pergamum is located, and in case people just tuned in, we've been comparing Christ's message in the book of Revelation to the city of Pergamum, to Christ's message to the church of today, the Christian church of today. And so um, lots of pictures of ancient Pergamum, drawings. Did you know what you were getting yourself into when you did a book like this? This is quite a project. I didn't know it was going to take four volumes. I thought I would do it in two volumes. I actually thought that this volume would be Pergamum and Thyatira. But when I began to get into Pergamum, I just knew that to do justice, I had to do one entire volume just on this subject. But, you know, it's it's so pertinent to where we are today. I mean, it's it's really Christ's message to today's church. 
I want to mention this other item that people can get through your ministry. And uh, it's Jesus' message to the Church of Pergamum in the form of an interactive multi-touch ebook. That is amazing. So now what was your marketing strategy? Were you thinking, okay, now this book is great for looking at the pictures, being on top of the coffee table, visitors come over, they go, hmm, that that looks interesting, and then they start flipping through the book, and then this other is kind of a book on the go, plus you could put videos. You did put videos. 72. In this ebook. 72 videos. And you took a, a film crew to Turkey. Tell us about that. Well, I've been to Turkey, I think, 15 times, and I'm getting ready to go there again. And it is just one of the most wonderful places on the planet, uh, starting from Istanbul, you know, the exotic feeling that you get when you go to the old part of Istanbul and so much history of Christianity. And then from there, you fly to ancient Smyrna, and there, from there, you drive to all the other seven churches. And I take big groups with me. I take photographers, historians. Uh, I've worked with the local historians uh, there in the city of Ephesus and Pergamum and from Istanbul. And we all get in a bus together and we spend about two weeks together going from site to site. We've actually done some excavation. We've measured off the cities. We have done original research in order to write what I've written in this book. And it's been very expensive. It's It's been a very expensive project. But I w- really, I wanted to be able to say that I gave my very best to Jesus on writing this book. Was history your favorite class in school? Oh, I was not a good student. What happened? I, I grew up. Uh, I really got serious about studying whenever I began to study Greek in the university. And when I started studying Greek and found that I had just like a natural ability to understand ancient Greek, it's the whole ancient world came alive to me. And so I've, in addition to our ministry, I've spent all of our free time with my family going to ancient places, going to, we've been to Egypt. I can't, I'm not even sure how many times we've been up the Nile, uh, Rome, Greece, Turkey, Israel, I mean, those are the places where Denise and I go and spend our time. Rick Renner's our guest today. I'm David Warren, your host. And uh, Rick, how would you describe the Christian church in modern-day Turkey? Well, there's hardly one there. The Most of the Christian population fled during World War I. And so it's very, very small. Uh, there is a church in Smyrna. It is a very small church. Uh, I'm not so certain that there is any kind of a Christian church in Ephesus at all. Uh, Pergamum, there would be no Christian church at all. They're gone. And, you know, Jesus said to these churches that if you don't repent, you will lose your lampstand. And and it's interesting that the only one where a church is really thriving is in Philadelphia. And that is the one church, Philadelphia and Smyrna. And those are the two churches for whom Christ had no rebuke. Hmm. Those, interesting, isn't is, it? Isn't that interesting? The other five churches, the other five cities are without churches. It's it's completely Muslim. Let's talk about your church Okay. in Moscow, Russia. What's the name of it? It's called the Moscow Good News Church, and we just completed our new building. And we didn't know it until the day after the dedication, but in the national news, there was an article about the opening of our facility which said that we were the largest Protestant facility in the country of Russia. Wow. I didn't know that until I read that in the newspaper. And David President Putin sent four representatives from the presidential administration to speak at our grand opening. And they said amazing things, things that I, I can't imagine that a politician could say in the United States. For example, one politician said, well, Jesus said, where two or three of you are gathered together, he is there. Today there are several thousand, so obviously Jesus is here. This was a politician. The second highest man in all of Russia said, well, this is definitely a branch on the vine because you're producing so much fruit, we know that you're connected to Christ. Another man sang a blessing over our church. I'm talking members of President Putin's cabinet. And 
we just sat with our mouths open. It was it was just amazing. And I would say on a regular weekend, we probably have 40 people come forward and make decisions for Christ. And we retain about 35% of those people that come forward. That's a very high percentage. And the church is doing wonderful. Last weekend, we had about 4,000 people in church. And you all speak in tongues in your church. We speak in tongues. In fact, we make a point to speak in tongues. <laughs> Just because we've decided that we are that's who we are, and we're not gonna we're not gonna sacrifice that. Why do you think s- Satan wants to snuff out speaking in tongues? Because it releases power. You know, when you remove speaking in tongues, you remove the gifts of the spirit. They're connected. Uh, praying in tongues creates a spiritual sensitivity, and where people eliminate that, they eventually eliminate everything else as well. If you're embarrassed of that, you're going to be embarrassed of everything. So I say it's the door opener. And if you don't have that, you won't have anything else. And our church is filled with the miraculous, and we're proud of it. We preach the blood of Jesus, and we're proud of it. And, you know, I have found that people rally around a strong message. People are not embarrassed if their pastor is strong. They like that. They want their pastor to be strong. And you can be kind and strong at the same time. Of course, we should be kind. I think give you like that. We should never be condemning. We shouldn't even be condemning of anyone's lifestyle. Well, there's no reason to be condemning. Jesus was not condemning. We can state the truth without being rude. And I th- and you may have to work on how to do that, but that's the call of God. What is the call of God on your life, Rick Renner? My call, well, David, I don't say it very often, but my call is really apostolic. It's the establishment of churches. And uh, apostleship is geographical. You know, and, and it has to do with the starting of the church. It's where you can touch other churches. It's uh, regional. And my call really is to the other side of the world. Now, my writing call is to the whole world. My books are all over the, all over the planet, and I'm so thankful for that. Uh, only God could have done what he, he has done with my books. But as far as my personal call, it really is to the Russian-speaking people. And my sons have married Russian girls. We've got Russian grandchildren. Uh, We are really a fully integrated family into the Russian society. And we love Moscow. Well, we've been talking about Volume 2 of A Light in Darkness series, No Room for Compromise, Christ's Message to Today's Church. And before I give the ordering information here, one more time, what is your goal for this book? My goal is that people would read this. Uh, one pastor just wrote me on Skype yesterday. I'm a, I'm a Skyper. And said, this is a very sobering book. And it is very sobering. And I want this book to make people really think about where the Western church is headed. And what do we need to do to be the church that Christ wants us to be? Well, there's the big coffee table book. And then, as I touched on, what you said is very exciting, Jesus' message to the Church of Pergamum, an interactive, multi-touch e-book. And in the picture here, you see someone looking at uh, the e-book on their computer screen. And another shot here, it's someone enjoying it on their, something like an iPad. It's the iPad. And 309 pages, 330 images. Uh, 23 image galleries, 73 videos over two hours total, and eight panoramas, 360-degree turns. What are some of those panoramas, some of the beautiful shots of Turkey? It's some of the shots of Turkey. For instance, with the seat of Satan, where the great altar of Zeus was, you will stand on that spot, but with your finger, you can literally rotate the whole thing so you can see it from every side. Those panoramas are worth the whole book. Tell us about another one. Another panorama would be the Temple of Trajan. It's like you move your finger and you walk through the Temple of Trajan. This was technology I didn't even know existed. But we were able to obtain it and use it in this electronic version. Oh, give us one more. That sounds interesting. Ephesus. You you can walk through Ephesus. You just move your finger and you just move right up the street. Now, is it like um, like a cartoon or is it like real footage like... No, it is real footage. It's photographs which we took, which are graphically put together by the computer... And when you move your finger on your screen, you turn left, you turn right, you can go backwards, forwards, 
It is amazing. Okay, then <laughs> we won't talk about all 73 videos, but what are some ones that you remember that you enjoyed filming? Those are videos which I did on site. Oh, where you're ministering. Yeah. I'm actually, or explaining. I'm, or ex- pointing I'm explaining. over there. And For saying, instance, I'm sitting at the Temple of Zeus, and I say, I'm sitting here on the seats of the Temple of Zeus. Let me tell you about what this was and what happened here. And I teach for two or three minutes and then we move on to the next location to the temple of trajan or we go to the great theater which is an amazing thing to see it's the steepest theater in the history of the world seats ten thousand people and you can walk up and down with me and i teach on site it's really almost like something you would see on national geographic i want to give the ordering information and i'd like you to pray okay because i want to go back to uh the whole purpose of this book, because you're on a mission. I mean, it's it's an art book, and congratulations on the new book, but I know there's a message in here that's even more important to you. The web address for either the hardback, coffee table style book, No Room for Compromise, or this interactive multi-touch ebook called Jesus' Message to the Church of Pergamum, the web address is renner.org, spelled R-E-N-N-E-R dot O-R-G, renner.org, and the toll-free ordering number is 1-800-742-5593. 800-742-5593. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this time with David today and with the friends that are listening to us. And Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, open my eyes to where we are as a church and to where you're calling us to make changes so that we can be the people the glorious church that you've called us to be. I pray particularly that you would give pastors courage and that you would give them wisdom for these times which we're facing. I know, Lord, that they're asking questions, sincerely seeking your face. And, Lord, I pray that you would answer them and that you would give them the boldness to do the thing that is right. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Rick Renner, come back and be with us anytime. Thank you. And a safe Return to Moscow, Russia, to you and your family. Thank you, David. For Rick Renner, I'm David Warren, and boy, do I mean it today. It's been another great road show. Thank you.